Today, we are joined by our featured speaker, Suresh Krishna, for a presentation on corporate strategy, followed by questions with our audience. Suresh, after several years on the board of Northern Tool, became CEO of Northern Tool and Equipment in April of 2020, which was certainly an incredibly challenging time to transition into a new leadership role. Northern Tool is a manufacturer and retailer of industrial equipment and home improvement goods, headquartered in Burnsville, Minnesota, with 120 stores spanning 22 states. Suresh has an ambitious growth plan for Northern Tool, aspiring to grow their retail footprint to over 300 stores by the end of the decade in order to capitalize on brand awareness built through their successful e-commerce business. Prior to Northern Tool, Suresh held senior leadership roles at Sleep Number, Polaris, United Technologies, and Diageo. I'm so delighted he's one of the people who has managed to stay in the Twin Cities through multiple senior, senior leadership and CEO transitions. That's just what we want. In those roles, Suresh was responsible for driving innovation, implementing operational excellence, building flexible supply chains, and leading mergers and acquisitions. Suresh received his BS in Mechanical Engineering from the National Institute of Technology in India and his MBA from the Kellogg School of Management. Suresh has also been a member of the Carlson School's Board of Advisors since 2018 and very actively supporting many of our initiatives in experiential learning and executive education and so on, just literally all across the school. We couldn't be more grateful for all of your engagement with the school, Suresh. So everyone, please welcome Suresh for his presentation. Thank you, Shri, for that kind introduction. Thank you, Carlson School, University of Minnesota, Wells Fargo, and Twin Cities Business Magazine, and all of you who are present, physically or virtually, for having me here today. It is an honor to be on a platform where I have watched several business leaders and learned from them. I did not get a chance to go to Carlson for my business education. However, I have been involved with the business school for over a decade. Back in 2010, I started at Polaris, a great Minnesota company, as the head of operations and supply chain. One day, I received an email from Professor Art Hill, who at that time was the chair of the supply chain department. In that email, he invited me to join the advisory board of the supply chain department. I was curious, so I got on the phone and asked him what is the role that he wanted me to play. Art informed me that the supply chain board was comprised of senior supply chain leaders from companies around the Twin Cities. He also said that he was looking for the advisory board to help him and his colleagues elevate the rankings of the supply chain department across all business schools in the US. He, of course, wanted our help in recruiting students for summer internships and full-time positions as well. I'm a big believer in academia industry collaboration. I also thought that this would be a great opportunity for Polaris to get involved with the business school, so I signed up. We used to meet every quarter and in those meetings, we spent a lot of time listening to lectures on the latest trend in supply chain. I did not find us spending enough time talking about how we could elevate the rankings of the supply chain department. The disruptor that I am, one day, I asked Art, Art, you have the attention of all the supply chain leaders in the Twin Cities. What is it that we can do to help you elevate the rankings of the business school? Can you put out a bold vision out there and then we can all rally and help you? The meeting ended 
And a couple of weeks later, Art called me and he said, the department had met and they decided to launch a new master's program in supply chain. And that program would be the destination for supply chain education across all business schools. And this would be the bold move that they wanted to make. And he was looking for the support from the board members. So that question eventually led to the formation of the Masters in Supply Chain program, which today is ranked in the top 10 supply chain programs in the country. Now, I did ask that question. However, it was Art and then his successor as the chair of the supply chain department, Professor KK, and the supply chain department itself that took on the mission and launched this program in a matter of just 18 months. That to me is fantastic speed by any standards. This in many ways is what Carlson stands for. Taking input from its students, its alumni, industry partners, and then turning it around into programs and degree programs and certificates for their stakeholders. This is how Carlson differentiates itself in a crowded business school education market. In 2018, I was asked to join the advisory board of the Carlson School. And over the last three years, I have served on that board. I have enjoyed my interactions with Dean Sri Zahir, the staff at Carlson School, and all the professors. So thank you very much for having, giving me a chance to be associated with the school. My story begins far away from here, in a small town in India, which was the center for steel and automotive manufacturing. I grew up in a town called Jamshedpur, and that town was the center for automotive manufacturing, steel manufacturing, and I got a chance to get a good, well-rounded education in a Jesuit school, which focused on academics and sports. I was a multi-sport athlete. I um, eventually specialized and focused on soccer, which I played all through college. I ended up getting a mechanical engineering degree, and I started my career in the automotive industry. Over the course of the next two decades, got a chance to work in India, Middle East, Europe, and the US. And in the US, we lived in Illinois, Ohio, Connecticut, North Carolina, and then Minnesota. There was a period in time that we were moving either cities or countries every two to three years. My wife, Bhuvana, was very supportive and moved with the family to all the places that we had to move to until the last move in 2015. We had just come back from Geneva, Switzerland, and for the first time, she said, we're not going to move anymore. <laughs> well, my wife, Bhuvana, is in the audience, and you can check with her. She hates the cold. And yet she chose the coldest place that we'd ever lived in to call home. Professor Miles Shavers, if you're in the audience today, this is one more data point for your groundbreaking research on why people who come to Minnesota stay frozen in Minnesota. <laughs> this was right after I had come back from an expat assignment with Polaris. And actually it made things pretty easy for me because when I was looking for another role outside of Polaris, I had a 50 mile radius to look for another job. Um, I joined Sleep Number, another great Minnesota company in 2016. When I was at Polaris, I got to join the advisory board of Northern Tool. And when I switched to Sleep Number, I stayed on the board as well. In 2019, Northern Tool was looking for a new CEO. The search committee, which was comprised of our owners, Ryan Kutula and Wade Kutula, and some of the board members, asked me if I would be interested. 
that question made me pause. I had worked in public companies my entire career. Northern Tool was different. It was private, family-owned, and operated differently. However, when I gave it more thought, I found some similarities that drew me in. First, I had worked in the last two companies, companies which were smaller, taking on the Goliaths of the industry. Northern, in many ways, was the same. A smaller company, taking on companies like Home Depot, Granger, Menards. Second, my background with my blue collar roots, having grown up in a town which was manufacturing oriented, industrial, gritty, was very similar to the customer base that Northern Tool has, which is predominantly tradespeople. And that resonated with me. So I decided to go through the interview process. Through the interviews, Ryan and Wade, who are in the audience today, convinced me that this is the right role for me. Now, Ryan and Wade don't think like Wall Street analysts. They don't think in terms of quarters. Nor are they calculating private equity type investors who are thinking of flipping companies every few years. They wanted a leader who could build a company so that they could pass it on to the next generation of their family. That to me was a one-time generational opportunity. So finally, when I got the job, I did get to reflect. The five years prior to that was probably a whole interview process in itself. Having been associated with Northern Tool for five years, I knew that Northern was a special company. Diamond in the rough. Historically, not much is known about Northern except that it is based in the Twin Cities. So let me tell you a story of how the company started. Northern started in the garage of Don Cotula in Egan, Minnesota, 40 years ago. He started it with one single product, an innovation at that time, a log splitter that was a kit that could be shipped to a customer. The customers would call in and the product would be shipped as a mail order. Initially, it was called Northern Hydraulics. And over time, the name changed to Northern Tool and Equipment. The company listens to its customers and added products and put other solutions. And today has over 100,000 items that we sell. But to understand Northern Tool, we have to go back in time to the childhood of Don Catula, back to Hibbing, Minnesota, where he grew up. Don's father was the son of Polish immigrants, and he owned a scrapyard outside of Hibbing, Minnesota. Don worked at the scrapyard as a teenager in the 50s and 60s, after school and on weekends. And it is in the scrapyard that he learned a lot of lessons that he put to use when he started Northern Tool. At the scrapyard, he got to see and work with a salesperson his father had hired named Art Anderson. Art was by far the best salesman in the scrapyard. Don would see, say that he not only was great at attracting customers, he was very good at retaining them too. In fact, customers would always go to him for advice. Don also learned that Art had a great way of talking to the customers, finding out why they were there, 
talk to them of their families, ask them what else they did, and almost always found what they were looking for at the scrapyard. And if he didn't, whenever he made trips to either Duluth or Minneapolis to sell the scrap, he would find those items and bring it back for them. These interactions allowed Don to form the values that we still practice at Northern Tool today. These are the values that have made us successful. The values are simple, twofold, focusing on the customer. Know your customer, provide value, act with integrity. And the second, focused on the employees, empower the individual, be entrepreneurial, and have fun. Over the course of the next four decades, last four decades, the company stayed an innovator and stayed entrepreneurial and added several thousand products and solutions for its customers. It also provided customers the opportunity to shop the way they wanted. Having started as a mail order catalog company, it opened its first retail store in the 80s. And in the 90s, it started a factory and opened more retail stores and also processed its first e-commerce transaction. In the 2000s, the retail expansion continued, opened more warehouses, and then a factory in China. And in the last decade, the fourth decade, it expanded its product portfolio to eventually have over 100,000 products that it sells to its customers. Several of the people who helped this build this successful company are in the audience today. I want to thank them for what they have built and appreciate the contributions they make for the company every single day. Despite the success Northern had had in its past, the company had stagnated from 2017 to 2019. Revenues were flat and profits were declining. So when I got a chance to become the CEO, I knew that we needed a transformation agenda to find the magic growth formula once again. I started in April 2020, and something else was happening at that time. COVID. While the country was shutting down, Northern had a very important role to play along with its employees. We were an essential business supporting the front lines. So we stayed open. We provided safety equipment, masks, PPE, chemicals for cleaning and disinfecting, and other products that was needed by people who were working on sites, job sites, while some of us could stay at home and work from home. Those are the people who are running the country. Given that we had difficult financial performance and the challenges of COVID, my leadership team and I had the perfect opportunity to build a transformation agenda. To begin, we wanted to understand things that made the company successful. We wanted to learn more about the customer and understand what is it that we did for them every single day. So we reconnected with thousands of our customers and listened to them directly. And very quickly we realized that our core customer are tradespeople. People like landscapers, farmers, contractors, welders, construction workers, and also serious do-it-yourselfers. We call them DIYers. So we looked at our 
mission statement and rewrote our mission. As a family business, we honor and serve the people who do the tough jobs. We also learned about things that we do well. We learned that our customer experience is unique and differentiated. We are an omni-channel company. In fact, I argue that we are the original omni-channel company well before the term got invented. We've been selling to customers online, retail stores, mail order, managed account, call centers, for over two decades. E-commerce is a strength of ours. In fact, 35% of our sales comes from e-commerce. Recently, Consumer Reports came out with a ranking of the best online stores. And Northern Tool was ranked in the top three of companies that are involved in tools and supplies. That's a great honor for us. We are also known for high quality products. We attract the tradespeople with national brands. Brands like Steel, Milwaukee, Honda. These are products that are known for high quality. And we have similar brands like this. We also have our own private label products. And 35% of our revenues come from these private label products. These products are also known for very high quality. Many times, customers come into our store looking for the national brands and end up choosing our private label brands instead. We are a manufacturer and an innovator, and we make about a third of our products, private label products, in our factories. One of them is in Faribault, Minnesota, and the other one in China. And the innovation capability allows us to differentiate versus competition. We also have the ability to repair and service all the products we sell. All our retail stores have a service shop with a trained gas engine based mechanic. And we service everything we sell, in fact, even the products that we don't sell, because most of our competition, when they sell their products, there's no way for you to get it serviced there. So most of them end up in our shops. So with all of these strengths, we set about putting together a new strategy that would allow us to have aggressive, profitable growth. First, we focused on revenues. And we put out a bold goal to say we want to double in size in the next five years. And to fund that growth, we focused on gross margin expansion, and we said, let's go get 500 basis points in five years. Our calculation said that if we got that kind of margin expansion, we would be able to fund our expansion growth efforts organically. And the two of them together would help us improve our profits five times from the baseline of April 2020. So let me walk you through some of the elements of our strategy. First and foremost, our growth strategy is based on retail stores, retail store expansion. Yes, brick and mortar retail store expansion. We believe we have a unique and differentiated approach to retail. Our salespeople are highly, highly trained in every category we sell. And this allows us to connect with the customers the same way that Art Anderson did in the scrapyard. Our salespeople talk to customers, understand what projects they're working on, and through these conversations are able to provide the exact solution that a particular customer needs. Our retail stores are unique. We also back up everything 
that we sell with a service strategy. As a result, we think retail expansion is going to remain a differentiator for us. Now, you would think that in this day and age, where every retailer is looking to expand online offerings, we are doubling down on retail. How do you think that would work? Well, let me first remind you that we are really strong in e-commerce. So when you look at our e-commerce sales, and this is the map on the left, it shows you the dense areas, the dark blue is the dense areas of e-commerce sales. The light blue is where it's less dense. So we have a nationwide presence with our e-commerce. On the right-hand side chart shows you our current retail store footprint. We've got 125 stores spread across 22 states, predominantly in the south and southeast and upper Midwest. Now let me tell you when we put these two together, what happens? We get significantly more sales in areas where we have retail stores and e-commerce. So illustrate this example, I wanna give you comparison of two cities, Houston and Chicago. We have nine stores in Houston and we have opened our first store in Chicago just last week. Now both of these cities are about the same size in population and in GDP, Houston is number three, Chicago is number three, and Houston is number four. But when we looked at the sales for Houston versus Chicago, our sales data, we sold seven times more in Houston per thousand customers than we did in Chicago. That proved to us that the combination of retail and e-commerce gave us significantly more penetration than just e-commerce alone. Now, when you look at Chicago and Houston, they have about the same e-commerce penetration. So this gave us confidence to double down on retail as our strategy, the most important strategy go forward. And if you look at the nationwide footprint, two areas I want you to focus on, the Interstate 80 corridor east from Chicago and then the Interstate 95 corridor from Washington DC up north all the way to Boston has tremendous open space for us. And hence we're gonna double down and open more retail stores much more aggressively than we've done before. Historically, we used to open four to six stores, four to six stores per year. We're gonna open 15 to 20 stores per year going forward, which will allow us to double our store count in the next five years. Our strategy is to open new markets like Chicago and also infill other markets that we are already present in like Houston and Dallas and Miami and Atlanta. Chicago is our first focus area. We're gonna open six stores in the next 12 months in Chicago. That's a big change for how we've operated and opened stores in the past. Now this approach dovetails very nicely with our brand building strategy. As part of our strategy work, we spent more time understanding our best customers. We wanted to understand what is it that is different about them so we learned about their mindset. And as we did this study, we realized that our best customers shared seven attributes, behavioral attributes, that made them different. So once we knew that, we went and mapped those seven attributes across the entire US to try and determine how many people are there who have these same behaviors. And that allowed us to find out our addressable market nationwide. Our current customer base is about four million customers. And as part of this study, we were able to identify that the two and a half million serious DIYers that we touch every year, that number could be about 10 times when we look at the new addressable market. Similarly, 
tradespeople, the one and a half million that we touch, we could be up another nine times if we found the customers with the right mindset. So clearly, for us, there is a lot of opportunity to go get and expand our customer base. Now, while opening retail stores will allow us to reach more customers, we believe driving brand awareness through aggressive marketing campaign is going to be an important way for us to get our word out and reach more customers. As we open new markets like Chicago, we're going to focus on local activation to get the word out in these markets. As an example, in Chicago, we just launched a TV commercial, and I'd like to share that with you right now. At Northern Tool and Equipment, we're here for the week-long warriors, those who work Monday through Friday and sweat through Sunday. We're here for those who get up early and leave the job site dirty. Northern Tool has thousands of professional-grade tools from the brands that build America, Steel, Milwaukee, and Lincoln Electric. We're proud to serve the week-long warriors every single day. Northern Tool and Equipment, quality tools for serious work. Isn't that great? This is the first time in 10 years we're going to be back on TV. Another area we are focusing on is innovation. We have been an innovator, and we remain one, and that's how we differentiate ourselves in the marketplace versus our uh, retail competition. For example, we have significant technology in spraying technology. We make our own pressure washers. We make our own agricultural sprayers. And as a manufacturer and innovator, we have more market share in these categories. Recently, Consumer Reports came out with the best of the best of pressure washer category. And our electric heavy-duty pressure washer was ranked the best in its category. It's a great honor for our engineers, design engineers, manufacturing engineers. And we're really proud that Consumer Reports chose us over a lot of other well-known names. This also allows us to bring products to market rapidly. During COVID times, our engineers got together to design a new line of COVID sprayers in a rapid fashion. In a matter of a couple of months, they pivoted, used our existing spraying technology to create a new line of COVID sprayers that was needed in the marketplace. We were able to support a lot of towns, municipalities, school districts. They were able to keep their facilities safe, the gyms safe. And we also donated these products to police departments and uh, fire departments around the country. So we are bullish on innovation. We're going to pivot and work on alternate energy, battery technologies, and also connected devices, allowing us to deploy technology that will connect all of these devices. It's something that a lot of our big customers who have fleets of products available, that they're looking for performance data on the products as they are out in the field. The most important aspect of our strategy, though, is how we plan to execute. And that is our team. I believe that our team is unique and has an ability to take on transformation agendas better than anybody else can. That's because our team practices the values instilled in us by our founder every single day. We compete with big players. However, as a billion and a half dollar company, we are ready to take on all the big players who may be even 10 times bigger than us. They have more resources, they have more capital, but we have our team members who are unique and different. Being entrepreneurial and being innovative is in our DNA. And being the David in the David versus Goliath fight, we do every single day very well. 
So let me give you an example that brings that to life. Northern has a very important role to play during disaster situations. Hurricanes, tornadoes, ice storms. We have products like generators, log splitters, chainsaws, and a lot of others that are used in disaster situations. Last year, the city of Lake Charles was hit by two Category 4 hurricanes. We have a store in Lake Charles. One such hurricane, Hurricane Laura, was particularly devastating. It hit in August 2020 and uprooted more than half the trees in the city. Lots of flooding, no electricity, houses damaged, buildings damaged. Our first concern was for our store people who worked in Lake Charles. We evacuated them and their families 60, 70 miles away to make sure they were safe. At the same time, a bunch of our managers, store managers from Houston and Dallas, along with some of their associates, started driving towards Lake Charles in their personal RVs. They reached Lake Charles within 24 hours of the hurricane passing. What they saw was utter devastation. There was no retail store that was there. Even our store was damaged. They coordinated with our warehouse in Dallas and started getting truckloads of products that are needed for recovery during these situations. There was no electricity. There was no place to stay. So they stayed in their RVs in the parking lot and made sure that folks who needed these products was made available to them, living right in that parking lot. When I talked to them, they said this, they are doing this for their colleagues. They knew that their colleagues who operate the Lake Charles store would want to serve their community, would want to take care of their customers. All they were doing was allowing their colleagues to put their lives back in order while they could then serve the local community. This is living the values of Northern Tool. And then you have employees who are willing to put themselves at risk to serve their customers. I have no doubt in my mind that any transformation agenda will get executed phenomenally well. In fact, 18 months into the role, from our baseline of April 2020, our revenues are up 40% and our gross margin rate is up 300 basis points. <laughs> While I have talked to you so far about our growth strategy from the core, we believe we have opportunity to improve these with adjacent growth platforms. Adjacencies are important. While we've not launched any adjacent strategy, we believe that very soon we will be able to tackle what we call adjacent growth platforms. The first platform I want to talk to you about is our subsidiary GNE, which is involved in a two step distribution model. GNE is a distributor of power equipment and parts and engines and sells to ACE hardware. True Value, Do It Best, and also sells to rental companies like United Rental, Lowe's Rental, and other independent distributors and dealers. If we're going to continue to invest in private label products, and we believe over time this particular platform of two step distribution can be expanded, particularly in markets that we don't plan to open our own stores. So think about the West Coast, Pacific Northwest. We didn't cover that when I talked about retail expansion, so this could be a very good way to get our private label products in those markets. The second is mobile service. Today, most of the service that we provide for products are in our retail stores. In the very near future, we have an opportunity 
to expand into mobile service. We have a very small business in the Charlotte area that is allowing us to service customers where they have their products installed. All of this started when we started selling some of our products to the NASCAR teams. Compressors, pressure washers. Early one time, some of the teams called our stores to say they won't have time to bring the products to the retail store, and would they mind sending the technician over to take care of the repairs? So our technician would go on the pickup truck and service those locations. The entrepreneurial spirit and being empowered, they found more customers who wanted this service. And slowly we were serving auto dealerships, body shops, think of all of them, they have wash stations. And then eventually they landed a big account, National Rent-A-Car. National, as you know, all rental cars have wash stations. And these people just on their own entrepreneurism found that customer. Today we service through a mobile service van network, 400 locations of National Rent-A-Car alone. National would want us to scale and go beyond the Carolinas to other states. So we're right at the cusp of another platform that could be several hundred million dollars for us. Another platform is parts. We recently acquired a company called Jax Small Engine. Jax is an online platform and a leader for selling engine parts for small engines. Any engine, that, any product that has a small gas engine based in it, they have parts for it. They carry over three million parts across 400 different brands. And it's the most trusted brand online. We bought Jax because we want to scale that business. We bought Jax because we want to have the ability to serve all our retail stores with quick delivery of parts. But we're going to continue to invest in them, and we are confident that not only will they serve us, they will serve other DIYers that are in our customer base. They will also be able to service other service shops, and we can scale this to be a very large independent business as well. And finally, acquisitions. Just like Jax was an acquisition, we are looking for more acquisitions. We believe there are other growth platforms that are out there that we can get, whether it's in manufacturing or distribution of industrial products and tools. And acquisitions will be an important part of our growth strategy. So our magic formula is to grow the core and to grow new platforms. We are confident that this is gonna be successful because of a culture which empowers innovation and entrepreneurism. Future for Northern Tool is very bright. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suresh. Uh, it's very clear that you've really led a major strategic change in this organization, and I know there are folks with questions, both in the audience and online. And, um, but maybe, please, uh, get your questions ready. And you know, meanwhile, maybe I'll just quickly ask you, I know you started this strategic transformation right in the middle of the pandemic. How did you get your workforce to kind of buy into this? I mean, this is a big change. That's a great question. Um... Many of them who actually built the strategy are actually in the audience. So our approach has been to democratize the strategy building process. So we had over 100 of our employees involved in the strategy sessions. We'd built that over a matter of four months and um, more than 100 people, and I think we calculated back of the envelope, maybe 10,000 man hours went into putting this together. Um, and throughout the pandemic, we met offsite uh, in large rooms, most hotel rooms were empty, so they were willing to give it away for free with uh, the big ballrooms where we put in 60 to 80 people, which could accommodate fire people, and um, brought people together so that we could really pose the question of what we needed to do. And the ideas that we are pursuing right now, they're a collection of 
our team's efforts. Um, everybody got to vote on it. It wasn't just me or my management team saying these are the ones we're going to pick. Um, everybody voted, and all the votes were equal. Nobody had a veto vote, and we picked the ideas that we wanted to pursue as part of building the strategy. Thanks, Suresh. You have someone there, Yes, right? we have an in-person question here, and I think we've got some coming in from our virtual audience as well. Mark? Hi, thank you for the great speech today. There's lots of things I could say. I think I remember when the company was Northern Hydraulics, you used a Minnesota North Star player named Neil Broughton to start your <laughs> marketing branding. That's a long time ago. That tells you how old I am. Second of all, if I can help you in the Chicago market, and I apologize for my voice, uh, WLS, ABC7, is the number one station down there. So when your advertisers are buying, I can't tell you how to run your business, but that's the place to go. Um, and you also <laughs> saved the Shrine Circus here in November. We had a, a snow cone machine breakdown, so you supplied the part. So I thank you for being open on a Saturday and saving the Shrine Circus. Secondly, and my most important question is, I want to know if you would ever franchise the Northern Tool Equipment uh, stores. Are you saying you're interested? <laughs> I might be. You had a great, great speech. <laughs> uh, thank you for bringing it up. I appreciate you being a customer of ours. Um, at the moment, we don't have any plans to franchise uh, all of our store openings. Uh, we have line of sight, too. We're going to open ourselves, and uh, these are all company-owned stores. But two-step distribution, if you're interested in California, let us know. And we have a question from the audience, or from the online, from Santi. It's a two-part question. Is there a business brand opportunity to play a key role in the trade shortage? And does the company have any plans to partner, say, with community colleges to help attract more human potential to the trades? Can you ask the first question again? I missed the first part. Absolutely. Is there a business or brand opportunity to play a key role in the trades shortage? Trades shortage. Fantastic. Thank you for asking that. Um, you know, we've been serving the trades community for 40 years. That's the core customer base, and we believe we have an important mission to support the trades. Uh, more recently, we have been involved in Texas uh, in expanding um, the Texas Welding Series. It's a high school program where we are a partner, and uh, we support students in high school with scholarships. We also host um, championships, welding championships, that allows kids to get exposed to other senior welders who are mentors, and they are the ones who are leading those competitions. We absolutely are doubling down on finding ways to partner with community colleges, high schools, so that we can build, help build a next generation of trades people. There's a tremendous shortage, as the question uh, noted, and uh, we believe it's, it's an important uh, aspect of our business. I mean, in many ways, it resonates with what Carlson's mission is, which is uh, Carlson is a force for good, and we believe doing good for the trades community is something that we will be involved in for a long period of time. Great. We have one from the audience here, and I think this is going to be our last question today. Suresh, thank you so much. Great presentation. In a really short period of time, you've already ramped up uh, the, the operations, and so uh, uh, congratulations. Job well done. As you look forward into the future, there could be lots of things as the organization spirals up that could be limiting factors to your growth. It could be access to the right people to run the stores. It could be supply chain issues. It could be a whole host of different things. What, what are you concerned about the most? What keeps you awake at night as you think about and imagine that future? Um, that's a tough one because you asked me to identify only one, right? <laughs> um, I would say talent is going to be the biggest challenge for us. Um, there are many, many, many challenges, but as you think about our scaling um, and we want to double our store count, we'll likely double our head count in a very short period of time. Finding talent in a market where you, know, you have people with great resignation leaving, you know, millions of people leaving the workforce, that's going to be our biggest challenge. And finding people with that right mindset. I mean, it's important for us to find the culture fit. Our, cost, our employees are unique, and finding those, because we generally find people through word of mouth, our people know who will be a good employee for our stores and our headquarters jobs, but that's going to be our biggest challenge. Thank you for asking that.